Ah, good evening. Uh, don't worry, we're not we're not waiting for other people's uh, streams to finish. We were, I was just waiting for uh, YouTube to actually take us live there. Um, welcome, welcome to a Monday stream. This is technically uh, actually Evelyn's slot, so I'll let her talk. Go on, go on, Evelyn. Yeah, hello. Uh, we are totally here as uh, an aspect of emergent behaviour, and there there has never been any Rupert Murdoch style manoeuvres to start us at seven o'clock and end something else at seven o'clock. I don't know what people yes. are talking about. <laughs> These are all conspiracy theorists. Well, we we to be fair, we were just going to do this at seven from the beginning, uh, mm. hang the rest kind of thing. But yeah, we've uh, hope we've got an interesting one today because we're we're going to be talking specifically about a collection of essays from it's from the nineties, isn't it? It's from nineteen ninety four, but it was written a lot of it was written during the Reagan era. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a smattering of things I think across old kind of. I think it's from. Yeah, from the, I think in the mid eighties right through to the nineties. Yes, it, it's it's a good collection of writings, and there's a lot of very good, very spicy stuff in there. It's also a, a book we've managed to find physically because it is like hen's teeth here in the UK. I have it. It's, I have uh, it here in my hands. I will yes, try and make we, book noises so you can we, tell. We I do have, have like <laughs> <laughs> the book noises. We do actually have a physical copy of uh, of uh, San Francisco Beautiful Losers, which is very difficult here in the UK. If you're uh, an Amerifag, you can probably find it uh, if you look secondhand or on Amazon, but it is still quite rare and can be quite expensive uh, mm. for a, a shorter, you know, it's a collection of essays. It isn't a an absolutely, like, massive tome you could kill, like, uh, a small furry animal with, like, um, like human action is. No, you would. Uh, uh. <laughs> I'm, I'm not accusing uh, Mr. Ludwig of being of creating some sort of rabbit killing tome. Don't worry. It's also a vital <laughs> component in most snares. <laughs> it's just, it's just a very, it's a big fucking book. Like he didn't, uh, he didn't like rats. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think San Francis might be a better a candidate for that. But uh, for those for those who don't know, the thumbnail is an MLK rally because one of the essays is about the the cult of Martin Luther King. Um, it's, but hey, it's, you better you better not mistitle that man. It's the cult of Doctor King. Ah, oh, Doctor. Yeah, you can't doctor, forget the credentials. Doctor in name, Doctor in bio. <laughs> credentials in bio. Ah, oh, dearie, dearie me. But for those of you who don't know, uh, Sam Francis is a, a peripheral figure, really, in the paleoconservative movement of the eighties and nineties. Mm. Uh, who has become increasingly relevant in recent years? His uh, magnum opus, *Leviathan: His Enemy*, was *Of Enemies* was published posthumously. Um, in two, he died in two thousand and four, didn't he? Uh, um, possibly two thousand and three. I mean, I think the manuscript is originally from nineteen ninety seven. I mean, it's oh, worth wow. it's worth mentioning. It was kind of funny actually. Uh, a has been was looking into him a bit earlier on today and dug up some stuff about. It. His whole running with D Dinesh D'Souza and him getting kicked out of uh, the Washington Times and all sorts of stuff. There's quite a lot to it, actually. Uh, I'll see if I can quickly uh, find that. Yeah, well, um, Awakened Peasant, we we didn't buy from a print-on-demand company. We actually found a new old stock copy from Amazon US. Uh, sorry, as as 2005 he died. Yeah, he died in 2005 and Leviathan was published in, like, oh. When was Leviathan actually published? It it was like 2014, I think. It was relatively recently. Um, because it, it's it's a hell of a book if you've read a lot of the pre prerequisite material. Mm. But San Francis is also be is also relatively famous for being a student of Burnham, who inspired him more heavily than the people realized in his lifetime, as is evident in Leviathan. Uh, yeah, 20 2016, maniacal foreigner says. Okay, we have got on that pretty fast then. Um. It's, uh, it's it's not too old of a tome, which I guess mm. is why it's so widely available. Um, yes, he did also write the Pat Buchanan speeches, but a, a lot of people don't realise or remember who Cat Buchanan was. Yeah, that is that's a, true. That is a very... It's like talking about Ralph Nader. Like, who the <laughs> fuck remembers Ralph... I remember Ralph Nader, <laughs> but no one else remembers Ralph Nader. I don't... <laughs> it's, it's a lot of... It's like who'll remember Gary Johnson in, like, 20 years' time. You'll be on some like niche political stream, and you'll be like, "Oh yes, that's just like Gary Johnson," and people will be like, "Who?" Yeah, it's the, it's the same way that like, people talk about like just obscure like 
I, I can't even really do it. Like British fifties politicians, like really specific One Nation Tory people. Oh, <laughs> oh God, the One Nation, the One Nation Tories are uh, are a bunch. Um, for those of you who don't know, though, we are actually monetized. We just had somebody join on the stream there. Um, GC Mitt, welcome. Thank you for becoming a member. Um, I'm not sure how long we've monetized for, but it is one of the better ways to support us. Um, we do also, I'll just try and get the link up, but we do also have a uh, Streamlabs link <coughs> where you can have your questions answered too if you don't want to go via YouTube. Um, I will put that in the chat now and I'll pin that. It is in the, it is in the description as well, but that's that's the way you can support the channel to give us a little bit of... Uh, I said beer money last time, but really it's book money because <laughs> holy shit, we've bought a lot of books recently. Um, <laughs> that's That's been a hell of an endeavor in of itself <laughs> uh, including this book actually like i said mm -hmm. we had to we actually had to import this from the us um not really something you can get very readily in the uk but uh but anyway we should probably get into it a little bit yeah um, we should uh we've got yeah i was gonna say there's the first chapter of course uh one of the essays the cult of dr king which i think we'll sort of kind of skim through a little bit because i think the the meat and bones of a lot of the arguments that are relevant to what's mentioned in this article are also in one of the closing ones which is a uh, quality is a political weapon which is searing searing material that's great it is ex it is i'm amazed at how concise he managed to make that one as well that one is extremely dense with with very 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 good points um a a something to remember about uh, Sam Francis going through this is that he was really a, an outspoken voice pretty much in the wilderness during the Reagan era because during the Reagan era was the 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 real last gasp of the traditional American conservatives mm. and the assertion of the neocon machine that ended you know started in Trump senior and reached its zenith with uh, Trump the junior and <laughs> and the establishment of the uh, of the cult of the forever war <laughs> um, he was a paleocon in a time when it was very unfashionable to be a paleocon, mm. um, and when people were extolling the virtues of the the energized base, as it were, of American politics, and and talking in breathless terms about this being the end of the left would move the of the post-war consensus and all this piss. Uh, <laughs> it, it it really was a horrendous time uh, that was. You know, it's one that I think one of the eras of recent history, that especially in political science, has been written into the history books as wrong as possible by some people. Mm. I think on purpose, <laughs> because oh. the idea that there was this ascendant conservatism in America, rather than the American conservatives conceding a you know a massive amount of ground mm. to, to the left and essentially becoming Lyndon B. Johnson style big country, big society, bossing the Negroes, conservatives. Um, it's, that, that's, that's what happened there. Uh, hundred years! Right, let's, uh, let's, not, let's not talk about the, uh, <laughs> the, the new work camps or anything like that. The new, yeah. uh, the new plantation. And we'll crack on instead with Dr. King, patron saint of the plantation. Uh, do you want to read this first bit or should I? Uh, you can start if you want. Uh, give me a second. The PDF version I've got is slightly broken, and I'm going to need to rearrange something just quickly. Uh, gosh, I shouldn't have said that. I thought I was on the right page, and I'm not. Now I'm, now I'm waffling as I uh, attempt to find this. This appears to be missing. What? Uh, no, that's the introduction. I'm, I'm, I'm having a moment. If you would start, please. Fair enough. <clears throat> The third annual observance of the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr. passed happily enough in the nation's capital with the local merchants unloading their assorted junk into the hands of an <laughs> eager public. The local oh. merchants, you say? I, I do like the the stuff from Francis like that, though, where it's, you know, it's possible he's just making a kind of humorous remark, but it's also, in a sort of certain sense, making a really base statement about, like, Jews commodifying leftism. <laughs> It is hardly surprising that King Day, observed as a federal legal public holiday since 1986, has already become part of the cycle of mass indulgence through which the nation economy, sorry, the national economy annually revolves. Christmas itself, commemorating an event 
almost as important as the nativity of Dr. King, has long been notorious for its materialism and ap appetitive excesses, and a visit to any shopping mall will alert the consumer to the next festal occasion on the public calendar and instruct him in what ways to what extent he is expected to turn out his pockets in the celebration. Since Dr. King, wherever he is now, has been promoted to full fellowship in the National Pantheon, it is to be expected that he too must perform his office in keeping, wheels, uh, keeping the wheels of American commerce well greased. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, quite... That is, that is quite funny. There's a lot of good stuff in here, though. He, he becomes extremely predictive, mm. especially in this piece about Dr. King. Um, I don't know. I think I think the, the the best thing to read next would be the thing about the state house. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember how far that down is now. Oh, that might be in the other essay. I think I might be. Uh, um, they, it's. I think it's about the NAACP. Oh, which, there's a, unfor there's a lot of stuff in, the, in this article about yeah. that one. Unfortunately, the the PDF version we've got of this book is imperfect and has been converted about three different times. And it says X double ACP for some reason in this version. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go in and correct it again at a later date and maybe actually put out there a nice, you know, lower file size PDF that people can read because the materials online for this book again are not ideal. It is quite a difficult one to find and read. Uh, possibly with a PDF of that as well, if the rights aren't too dodgy for it, Mister Skeptical Waves might want to get around it and put it up in full. Which would make his um, job a bit easier. Yes, it should do. Yeah, um, uh, I was going to start on the second paragraph there. <clears throat> oh yeah, go, go for it. <clears throat> what is remarkable, remarkable about the King holiday, however, is that alone among the ten national holidays created by Act of Congress, it is celebrated in other ways that are pretty much in keeping with its original purpose. While the other nine festivities are merely excuses for protracted buying and selling, three-day weekends with an attractive compadre or orgies of eat and swill punctuated by football games, only the second Monday in January is the regular subject of solemn expediations by Brahmins of the Republic as to what the day really means. Newspaper columnists, television commentators and public school teachers, the nearest things we have to a priesthood, devote at least a week to discussing Mr King's life, or sorry, Dr King's life and achievements and their place in our national consciousness. I love that <laughs> line there. Newspaper, newspaper columnists, television commentators and public school teachers are the nearest things we have to a priesthood. Yeah. Which is, you know, it, the writers of the word, the speakers of the word, and the teachers of the word. Uh, <laughs> which is... Uh, it's, it's, I sh it's straight out of Carlisle, which is very nice. Yes. It's that sort of idea of the... Uh, it's also kind of uh, the same sort of issue, or the same sort of idea as the fourth estate, is it not really? The sort of media class that then becomes your new priesthood. It, 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 you have to have a secular priesthood in this... Uh, in this post-faith society that that is uh, still still coalescing its its godless self, <laughs> well, even not to not to sit and make it all a show of Doctor King's personality, which I don't think it's actually the, the article really focuses on much, which is quite nice because no. it's usually the takes you see is just attacks on character, which are fair enough in a lot of ways, and it's partially the statement I make, but in a, in the same sense that Carlyle talks about like heroes and the men that are you know held in reverence in society. When you get to the sort of modern era where we are as corrupted as we are, are people, you know, people like Martin Luther King, who if you know anything about him personally outside of the stuff that he, was, he did in media as part of a civil rights activist, was not a particularly good person in any way, shape or form. I mean, it's, this is more about the, the, the implementation of the King myth into the national, like it's like the national pantheon of American thought. Mm. And that no one, like all... All of these media outlets, the media falls over itself to celebrate, you know, King Day as prescribed. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's the there's the, the very cringeworthy debate every year about, oh, they're stopping us saying Merry Christmas, guys. But the, no, no one would try and, like, usurp and repurpose Martin Luther King Day in any way, shape or form. It is it is act too sacred to the cathedral for them to do such a thing. Mm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's he go he, he goes into a little bit about uh, Doctor King's communist friends. Um, uh, I, I, but it's, he, it's is it not the part on uh, the fate of Jimmy the Greek as he refers to? It, yes, it is. Which starts to get into essentially his, I think his early realizing of what we now call things like a cancel culture and yeah, such. But the the guy essentially made a comment about black athletes uh, being of a, a shall we say a certain breeding stock 
from previous eras and therefore that's the reason why they've uh, got big thighs they can jump higher and run faster because of their bigger thighs and then the guy he's, he's, basically, he's basically saying the reverse perspective of white men can't jump yeah um <laughs> It's not making a very controversial statement there, to be honest. No, but he, he essentially gets papped at his job for that. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is like 1994, uh, Mr. Francis coming onto the scene and denouncing cancel culture well, well ahead of the curve, mm. but in, in less, in less like, stupid social media terms than we have now. Uh, there we go. Um, there's, a great, there's a great bit here. Um, uh, it's... it's it's where it says Dr. King understood if you want to search for that it says Dr. King understood um, sorry he's talking about the the principle American society is not only a legitimate goal but also the principal legitimate goal of our national endeavours Dr. King understood this well himself expressing it in the uh, um, millennium oh, sorry millennium imagery he loved and used so effectively I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted every hill and mountain shall be made low the rough places shall be made plains, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh see Sorry, it I've, together. Sorry, I've got myself very lost here, I'm afraid. It says, uh, Dr. Kong uh, um, it understood this well. Yeah, It's, no, it's, it's just, a further down the essay. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Sorry. It's just because it's a bit cut up. <laughs> yeah, Dr. King, of course, seldom troubled to ask for the yes. sources of his dream. And today it occurs to no one to ask why his dream should prevail over less grandiose dreams of others. Like all charismatic prophets, he was the out, uh, he was the font of his own authority, and his private visions were intended to become law for lesser men. Um, among the several hills and mountains that await lowering by the new god and his Gnostic bulldozers, is a tradition common among white southerners of displaying the Confederate flag in places of honor. Uh, some southern states, Alabama and South Carolina in particular, still fly the banner over their state capitals while the other official flags of several other southern states uh, retain its St. Andrew's Cross design in one way or another. The NAACC has recently decided that the flag must go, and has given the project priority in its current legislative agenda. He's, he's really talking about the, the big bleeding-edge racial issue of the day, which was the displaying of Dixie on state houses, which is a, he's now a settled issue. This is a mm. battle that the right ceded completely and lost. Um, and we're now talking about the removal of, of you know, as he gets into here, the removal of Confederate statues. Um, and in, sorry, the, the, legis- um, the NAACP has recently decided that the flag must go and has given the project uh, priority in its current legis- legislative agenda. And innumerable southern schools already have been obliged to give up using the flag as a symbol of their local football teams, along with playing Dixie and calling the uh, teams the Rebels and other traditional uh, usages distinctive of Southern cultural identity. In Alabama, the state representative Thomas Reed threatened to tear down the flag over the state house if it was not removed. It wasn't, and Governor Guy Hunt had the local head of the NAACP arrested when he clambered over the fence with his merry band of icon smashes. See, if this was, if this happened, like, I don't know, a year or two ago, we'd all be making memes of, like, Governor Guy Hunt with, like, laser eyes and, like, you know, the the Chad Governor Guy Hunt versus the, the virgin flag grabber Thomas Reed and all this kind of nonsense. <laughs> Uh, Alabama representative Alvin Holmes readily compares the Confederacy to Nazi Germany and instructs the people of the states that they need to forget about the Confederacy. This is extremely friend-enemy distinction. Mm. And again, it's a, it's a fight. The bleeding edge of the fight, like I said, was the, the, the Dixie was still displayed on state houses by this point. Now we're talking about, you know, armed gangs going around and, like, unilaterally pulling down statues with the help of uh, government-funded NGOs. Mm. It, what it, he is warning about as the end point of the slippery slope has become entirely true now. Yeah, well, it's, it's also, it shows how the the complete dominance of all aspects of judicial process in America weren't quite dominated at that point in the same way that they are now. I mean, that is the reason why these people can go and pull a stunt like you know, as you're saying, getting a, getting a big organised gang and getting a big van and pulling down, you know, some 200-year-old statue or something like that. Because ultimately, if if they've got the right lawyers on side, the attorney general's on side, the, the court judge is on side, and all these other people are on side, then they just walk with a really cheap bail. Yes. 
<laughs> yeah, they do. That, that's that's the point. They they have they have become the establishment even more so. Uh, AA asked is that scrump on here? Yes, it, I have been supplanted on my own YouTube channel. But yes, this this is the scrump man. And and Francis was very spicy for a nationally syndicated journalist. Um, 1994 though, in the 90s was really the getting towards the end point. Uh, I can't remember when he was fired from. Was it National Review who was fired for, or was it um, somewhere else? Because he he was a nationally syndicated communist, a, a columnist. Sorry, a communist. Good lord. Uh, no, so um, he, was, un- he was writing for until... Washington Times and then later wrote for National Review. Yeah. Yes, he basically got papped out for uh, for for being far too spicy on the civil rights question. Um, hmm. Time eventually did ca- um, catch up with San Francis, and he was, you know, in in the late nineties, early two thousands, essentially cancelled. Yeah, it's that sort of saying it about earlier on the whole Dinesh D'Souza story and him essentially writing an article and slandering because San Francis spoke at an American Renaissance conference or something like that and mentioned things possibly to do with the uh, demographics. <clears throat> Yeah, he was fired in, t- in uh, 2000, which is the point that Sam Francis and his beliefs become verboten in the American conservative movement, just just in time, really, for the rise of the new neocons. Yeah. He was far too inconvenient for the Bush era. Yeah, but the... He, the edge of the Overton window had moved past him, and he was unpersoned by the well, American conservatives. Especially, like, you be- you'd never see this sort of defense of southern kind of Dixie culture anymore at all. I mean, he must have been no. probably one of the last people, including Rothbard, to really make any sort of appeals ultimately to, like, the South will rise again kind of types, which is kind of funny because they try and go into describing that character, but then they try and tie it to, like, Nazism and, you know, it's, uh, what's the line he's got in here? Uh, show me a guy who rides around with Confederate flags flying in his front fenders and I'll show you someone who thinks the Civil War still goes on. I'll give you a racist who thinks it's only a matter of time before this nation makes white supremacy its official policy and returns to slavery, with black people the God-designated hewers of wood and trawers of water. Mr. Rowan apparently yeah. has never had a dream of the day when men would not be judged by the colour of their front fenders. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite funny. But the, the yeah, the, again, Rowan from the end of, um, NAACP, he's, he's basically talking about this a st- you know this imagined version of these like southern uber mensch waiting <laughs> yeah. waiting for the south to return and slavery to reassert itself and these these people didn't exist then and they don't exist now uh i don't know, it'd be kind of cool if they did exist but <laughs> it's i said another uh, one of those ones where journalists write one of our fantasies i don't know how they yeah, keep but- looking and say my dreams there's these there's these people who who live in like the the, the shacks in the swamp and like bench four hundred pounds and are just <laughs> are just waiting and just sat there waiting with their muskets but it's uh it's unfortunately Mr Rowan's fantasy. <laughs> but yeah, it it gets into more the the sort of general popular view of the South at the time as well. We're just sort of discussing that you know the Confederate flag as a symbol of things other than racism, oh, Southern cultural he- identity. Or- I don't know if you want to continue what you're saying there. Oh, or... sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, it's he's talking about uh, southern cultural identity. Um, th- sorry, it's uh, he talks about southern cultural identity and the and that is merely a matter of time before the Confederate flag is sundered, along with local statues of Confederate veterans and heroes, Dixie, and almost all memorials of antebellum civilization. He was right. Mm. That is what's happening. Right now, that is an incredibly prophetic paragraph there. Yeah. It is, it's that sort of example of one of the things that will come up later in the uh, article, which is this sort of notion that equality has nothing to do with equality. is is imperialism <laughs> under another guise, which is why you, you must sort of stand still whilst black progressive culture subsumes all your institutions and oh, he, when they he come again, attacking what, yours you, you are powerless to do anything about it yes there there is there is always going to be another step that is that is the point being made here and that if if the southern states had had stopped the tide at at flying dixie they'd still be fighting that fight it's it's the it's a great argument against reform and compromise is what it is mm. Uh, he also points out the fact that basically every school child in America 
he's he has it re repeated to them over and over and over and over again that the three most prominent uh you know heroes of american history george washington thomas jefferson and um abraham lincoln and that the first two of them were slave owners and that is like drilled into people's heads mm. that is the original that is shown to people as the original sin of the united states yeah that that's... its founding myths are hollow because its founders were slave owners and that's how the civil war is then a righteous war and the the, the sort of federal imperialism of the government is a a righteous force <laughs> Well, the there's a there's a lot of great stuff. Um, I can't remember the guys. I, I recently linked it to somebody. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff by uh, Donald W. Livingston about the South mm. and the the myth of it of the Civil War being about slavery, because one of the, again it's like the great lies of World War Two and the great lies of the of that century was the fact that the the Civil War was a war to liberate the slaves. It, it never was. Mm. <laughs> that was almost incidental to the war itself. He also has a very good speech uh, called The Rise of the Nation State, which I borrow heavily from continuously because of his great example of the Holy Roman Empire and its distributed model of power, but that's an aside. <laughs> um, I will actually, because it's so good, put a link to that in the chat if people want to bookmark it because it is a... A very good video but you can search you can look at all the stuff by Daniel uh, Donald W Livingston about the South and the myth of the South and the uh, the myth of the Civil Wars uh, he's he's a great speaker and he's been on uh, the Mises U stuff uh, quite a lot in the past I think he's got a bit old for it now though mm. um, when there is I don't know not to, not to totally skip away from what you're talking about to sort of try and keep with the uh, the article oh no yeah I just want to attention don't mm. worry <laughs> But it, th there is the sort of, there are a lot of the later effects of things that he would have read directly from Burnham and then go on to write about in Leviathan and its enemies that yes. you can then see the effect of and the things that he's describing. I mean, there's the, the paragraph I've sort of now put in the middle of the screen that I had slightly hanging off the bottom of read. But nor is it merely the physical symbols of the old America that are shattered by the new good we have chosen to worship, and, or sorry, the new God. <laughs> In, uh, in May 1987, Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall proclaimed in a public speech that he could not find the wisdom, foresight and sense of justice exhibited by the framers of the US Constitution particularly profound because they do not bow to the egalitarian and universalist idols in the shrines where Justice Marshall has worshipped all his life and because they failed to include blacks and women in the Constitution, the document they drafted was defective from the start. No doubt it is astonishing that an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court could say that the fundamental law of the country, which it is his business and his duty to interpret, is inherently flawed, but the Justice merely forces up, uh, us up, up another rung in the ladder. We forfeited the right to revere the Constitution, the governmental principles and mechanisms it established, and the men who wrote it when we put Dr. Ken into the pantheon. Oh, it's just... He... Well, he, he, he then goes on to say... Oh, sorry... Uh, I was going to say it's just it's the it is the direct effects of these new reformulations of kind of enlightenment values that ultimately turn into sort of managerialist projects such as equality and women's rights and civil rights. You know these these ultimately ways of socially engineering society that need to be enforced and then get worshipped by the people who are raised in it that then they can garner unbelievable amounts of power and basically say that 200 odd years of constitutional law be damned. You know, it's it, it, we need reform. And it, that's ultimately how the left does its revolutions. It's through yes. the, the latter effects of pulling down previous sort of artefacts of society, such as, not artefacts, but uh, maybe that was the right term, but such as God, for example. Well, oh, it's... It, it literal artifacts of society like literal artifacts mm. of the past like the, the you know get war memorials essentially like pe people don't realize that a lot of the the stuff that was pulled down were were not they, they were already pc statues it's like oh this statue was put up in the 1970s it's like yeah that statue was put up in place of a different statue because it's a general memorial to just the dead people Mm. Who died in the Civil War? It is, it is, it is already a neutered symbol of you know of antebellum. It is, it is just a symbol of human loss in a war. It does not even really commemorate the society before it. And all kinds of monuments like that were pulled down. 
Well, it's ultimately sort of a, a lesson you would get maybe out of possibly Schmidt, which is that, that that sort of neutral position of, oh, well, we'll just appease, but still have the symbol in a, a sort of vein and hollow form. Yeah, it's, it just doesn't work. Because you've still got no. a symbol there and they'll still attack it. Because it's still, you know, a symbol of the enemy, essentially. Yeah, it's the, the symbol is immaterial. Having having the enemy and attacking the, the symbol of the enemy is, is what's important. It doesn't really matter what the symbol is. Mm. That's kind of the point. Um, the, he he makes a bit of an appeal here to what I, what I would always refer to as the spirit of 1776. Mm. Is he, he talks about the federalism, rule of law, states' rights, limits on majority rule, checks and balances, and separation of powers that characterize the Constitution are all incompatible with the constraints um, on the full blossoming of the egalitarian democracy that Dr. King envisioned, and which is the completion of the radical reconstitution to which his holiday commits us. He... He actually, I think, not contradicts himself, but refines himself in, in when, he, when he writes in Leviathan. Because if you read Leviathan in its totality, you start to realize that the egalitarian pretensions of the Constitution really sow its own demise. Mm. Um, that this, this really is the end point of the lofty, you know, fairer than thou uh, anti-monarchy language <laughs> that the United <laughs> States was founded on. And their rejection of what they would consider unaccountable power and their appeal to, you know, the people, to we the people, is what leads us to the cult of Dr. King. Hmm. Because if we the people become, you know, these feckless, uh, uh, timid and borderline, uh, you know, politically illiterate people, then, you know, it's still government by the people, of the people, for the people. You know, to, to, to paraphrase... Uh, that 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 guru, the people are just retarded. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's it's him appealing, I think, to the Constitution was him appealing to the zeitgeist of the time. This is partially being written during the Reagan era, mm. and he's trying to you know energize the paleo base by saying you know they're destroying America essentially. They're destroying the idea of America, but in some ways the idea of America itself is self-destructive. If you yeah, look at the language. Is, I would say that's something me and Peter Coynes talked about quite a lot during our discussion of anarcho tyranny, was that it's not necessarily explicitly stated in what he's saying, but ultimately what you can take from it is that the the appeal to law and order eventually comes from goes from being a, a strong point within your society to a weakness because the order and the law become subverted and you you no longer become in control of it. And because those, you know, egalitarian and constitutionalist values that the American government was not necessarily entirely founded upon, but was evolved into through some of its other weaknesses. Um, there's a quick uh, super chat here I want to address before we move on. Um, so I did my research, and seeing as how often America likes to use false uh, flag events to, to bring them into a war, one must ask, what does the South gain from starting a war with the North? Well, there's a reason it's it was referred to in the South as the War of Northern Aggression. But mm. um, it it's, it's really is... Uh, the, the Civil War is an interesting one, because it is, it's, it's the friend-enemy-fying of secession. It's really a war about, okay... Within the United States, within its constitution, there has been, you know, the idea of it's a federal, you know, a federation of states, and you know, is secession legitimate? And the Civil War being used as the symbol, and these, these secessionists being turned into these cartoonish caricatures of themselves, is is what we see really with the with the defeat of Nazi Germany as well. Is that these people end up as the the boogeyman villains? Yeah. And, what what it's what really the history is trying to tell you is that secession will not be tolerated. Mm. Um, well, that's the that's the the general notion in here is that if if Doctor King is the embodiment of modern society and fairness, then the the Dixie South is you know is the eternal enemy of fairness in that sort of sense. And that if and the, because of the Martin Bailey aspect of equality. That statement is actually literally true because if you understand what Martin Luther's equality was, it was actually an attack politically on non-black people for whatever they could take. Well, it is also the legitimizing factor of the civil rights movement, which had essentially come to fruition mm. before Dr. King ever spoke on a podium. 
um, because Lyndon B. Johnson decided he wanted a whole bunch of votes. Um, <laughs> that's that's really the the long and short of it. The Supreme Court had already sided with black Americans. Uh, essentially, segregation and freedom of association uh, within the South had, had already ended by that point. Mm. It was already a foregone conclusion that the power center was behind them. I mean, the president was behind them. What, what, what more do you want to see? Um, it's it's a great kind of like with uh, ideology being post hoc and justifications being after the fact. Um, it, it's a it, there's a there's a whole demonstration of that, that that needs to be gone through at some point and probably will be if we do the post democratization stuff. We keep threatening every single time we stream, every single yeah. time we stream, because but we we do need to read a lot more before we just take that. Because good lord, there is uh, there is so much to to dig into. Especially with the civil rights era. I don't know if if AA gets on well with uh, Thomas Triple Seven. Maybe we can maybe we can get him to come on because he is supposedly like the the dude when it comes to LBJ and Nixon and these kind of characters. Oh, uh, that'd be interesting. Yeah. Um, need to get some more guests on at some point. Um, uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll try and crack in as much of the the rest of this article as we can before we go on to the next one. Yes. Um. Where. Where do we want to read from then? Um, uh, I don't know. I'm just having a quick sort of glance through at the moment. I mean, I, th- I don't know. I'm just I'm tempted to go on to the next one kind of sooner rather than later because it's. I think we're going to have quite a long discussion. Yeah. Um. He, I mean, he's the final the final paragraph of this piece. I will I'll read then. Mm. Um. Because he he goes into some more appealing to the American myth. Really. Yeah. He says. Um, um, that legacy, as to its keepers now, is profoundly... It talks about Dr. King's legacy. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. Uh, most of all, who can press a far more persuasive claim to King's legacy than conservatives of any description? He's talking basically about the the beat stick that Dr. King has used against any form of American conservatism. Um, that legacy, as its, keep, um, as its keepers now, is profoundly at odds with the historic American order. And that is why they can have no rest until the symbols of that order are pulled up, root and branch. To say that Dr. King um, and the cause he really represented is now part of the official American creed, indeed the defining and dominant symbol of the creed, which is both, um, which is uh, what both houses of the United States Congress said in 1983 and what President Ronald Reagan signed into law shortly afterwards, is the inauguration of a new order of the ages in which the symbols of the old order and the things that sim- uh, the things they symbolized can retain neither meaning nor respect, in which they are as mute and dark as the gods of Babylon and Tyre, <laughs> and from whose cold ashes will rise a new god, leveling their rough places, um, straightening their crookedness and exalting every valley until the whole earth is flattened beneath his feet. <laughs> Good lord! I mean, there's, um, there's... And perceives the glory of a new lord. He's. <laughs> he... I was gonna say there's there's so much in that. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, I think we we sat and discussed this for a little bit yesterday, and one of the things I had sort of considered is, you know, it, it is it is bizarre that MLK's sort of vision then became the vision really of the the contemporary right, not the contemporary left, because in about a decade or two later, the left had forgotten the fact that, like, Christian people that had families and children, they they forgot they existed. You know, they were off onto something else, and uh, even to the extent that radical elements were denouncing Dr. King for not wanting the same freedoms for, say, I don't know, gay black people or something like that. So that you know they've they've moved on to a whole new bracket of abstract political capital in the way that they need to because they understand that you know once you appeal to these things, the appeal has been consumed and you know it's a bit like the uh, Kantian effect, you know you can garner the value from the policy when you're implementing it, and then you don't really have to live in the effects and anyone that comes in afterwards trying to do anything about it doesn't really matter because the novelty well, of are- dealing with that issue has already been settled. It also dilutes the the policy done before, and you have to basically. It's like the, the idea of like printing controversy and like printing conflict. You have to print ever more societal conflict to keep above water. <laughs> it's it's like leftist uh, degradation inflationism. It's like I... the, the idea that you have to just keep producing ever more of this shite as a bigger bigger fire hose to to tread water. I mean, maybe, maybe um maybe I'm saying the quiet. 
quiet part out loud and I'm stating the obvious, but is, is Dr. King really here is just a euphemism for civil rights? He's, he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's a euphemism here for civil rights as like the personified version of a state leviathan. But not, they... <laughs> not just that, though. Just even the, the considerations of actually thinking about it dynamically in the way that he is here, about like how does it come into policy and how would you actually fight it? And ultimately, in trying to fight it, you would understand that it is, you know, it is a godlike figure, essentially, in the minds of modern man. Yes. It, it, it's, it's one of the, again, a new founding myth for the, the state person, the hmm. personification of state. You know, it's it's no longer someone <clears throat> like you know Thomas Jefferson. It is someone like Dr. King. He is he is the face of the state person, the Leviathan. Is uh, um, it, it is? I think it it's, it does link into his his later work, and I I kind of enjoy him talking about this stuff because it does sound grandiose to say, but what he's talking about is is the use by Ronald Reagan very very consciously. Of this holiday is like an appeasement move. Uh, you know, at the, the very least, it's an appeasement move, if not part of the Republican repositioning strategy. Uh, in, you know, from the paleocons to the neocons. Um, you know, essentially uh, conceding the entire civil rights argument. In, in you know, in its totality. Well, um, I mean, in a, in a very mask off sense, the civil civil rights did bring about a level of equality. It brought about a level of equality that all people were ultimately tenants of the state. No longer were they people that lived in guaranteed land that belonged to them. You know, they're now just, they're essentially there until the state decides that for one reason or another you are stopping not just the policy of civil rights, but the myth of civil rights. There's the, there's the entire, like, brain short circuit that normies do when you say that you're not a fan of the civil rights movement. Mm. And that they, they're like, why would you allow people to use their freedom to be racist? <laughs> is, is, their in, is their entire argument. It's like, if you have freedom of association, then people could choose to be racist, and that's bad. Therefore, we, don't need to, we shouldn't have that. Mm. Like, that's, that's the argument that is boiled down to its essence, the, the civil rights argument. Mm. The private property... Uh, rights are secondary to the integrational rights uh, imposed by a state. Whether you you know whether you agree with that or not, that is the foundational power argument there. That the the rights of the individual to use his property in a way that is seen as bad by a government should not exist, and that is a universal erosion. Um, it, you know, a lot of people can't can't you know, separate it from the deliberately emotional argument. But that's that's the whole point. The whole point is to put it all in these grandiose terms and, and distract people from the the power politics on display there. Clever bastards. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's, it's a trick that only works with hegemonic power, though. The, hmm. and, uh, you're right, it, it's consuming. Um, and eventually, as, as we do like to talk about it, it has to lead to some kind of collapse point, which if people have... You know, as, as you talked about with uh, with Mister Mister, I, I can never he. I've heard people say his name too many different ways. Quinones, Quinus, as you talked about on the the, the Uncle Ted stream mm. uh, about learned helplessness. Really, what it does is it leads to at some point an era of like incredible mass death because people can't look after themselves. Um, <laughs> and that it's inc an incredibly unkind and evil thing to do to a population is to subject them to a period of learned helplessness. Because it means that they they have a period of death, but again the the civil rights movement was a, another step in that because really what happened is that people learned to rely on government forces to you know enforce their rights to an even greater degree rather than simply choosing to do it themselves. Uh, shall we move on to the the second essay in the series then? Uh, yeah, we probably should because I want to try and get as much of this in as we can because it is. Oh, it's as I said, it's, it's searing material, it's scorching hot. It's I don't know. If, it is very spicy. For uh, me, I think this having is... that was it. For me, having sort of trying to get into some of the elite theory stuff, some of the points he's making in here are other than in things like you know you see them nowhere else other than Pareto, Burnham, Mosca, maybe a bit of McKell's and maybe George Sorrell in some places. But otherwise, you, you you don't really see this sort of just outright analytical kind of 
view of equality as, as a process within society, society I, or even as a, a logical sh- construct. I think this is probably one of, if not the best, like post-1945 deconstruction of egalitarianism. Oh yeah, definitely. This is probably up there. I mean, I, I have the book downstairs, which is uh, Rothbard's Egalitarianism as a Role Against Human Nature, which I would imagine probably Francis was reading around about the same time this was put out. Yeah, because we, for those of you who didn't watch it or didn't see it, um, we had a stream with Phil Bishop from the Mises Institute mm. about a review of Be- Beautiful Losers that Rothbard did. And he's speaking again, he's using the Rothbard time machine, as we keep referring to it, <laughs> yeah. to, to like grab us, to reach out of the screen from the grave, grab us by the shoulders and go do something about this. <laughs> that, that's, that's like the language on display here. It's like he's looking at the camera. It's, uh-huh. it, it's kind of unnerving sometimes. But there was this, people, there was this feedback loop right you know, in the mid-90s, as all of this was actually dying, unfortunately. Mm. As the as the paleo conservatives and paleo libertarian movements of the time were running out of steam, and their core figures like Francis and Rothbard were being sidelined to an extreme degree, there was this confluence of of the beautiful losers, as it were, as of the people who essentially were left out of the narrative of the day, to to create essentially the things we're talking about now, the the stew of ideas that's reemerging. Mm. Thank God for the Mises Institute. That's all, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those guys are, have, you know, they've they have legitimately kept the frame alive and are a great example of the rule of an explicitly right wing organization will stay an explicitly right wing. It's yes. like the opposite of the rule. Um, they they are they are the white pill on that front. Right. Anyway, um, should we try and get into this because there's loads yes, of stuff yes. here and there's points I want to make about some of it because I think there is a point that Francis misses here because he's missing the secret key to understanding all of 20th century history, which I will get to into in a moment. But, again, <clears throat> for many years, a staple theme in traditionalist conservative political theory have been critique of egalitarianism. Indeed, some old right theorists have gone so far as Wilmore Kendall and George Carey to argue the common denominator of the liberal positions, the principles or beliefs common to all of them, is the principle of quality itself. The conservatives' critique of egalitarianism has in large part been a formal critique, that is, one that takes egalitarian expressions at more or less their face value and then proceeds to criticise the logic of these expressions or the degree to which they correspond or fail to correspond to the realities of human nature and human society. I mean, He's essentially criticising people for, pulling, for calling out leftist hypocrisy on Twitter. <laughs> I mean, in a certain sense, yes, but he doesn't... He sort of gets into why he thinks part of this is true and part of it is true because people don't think about it properly. However, uh, I in that era, you know, you're talking about end of, or, you know, after the Cold War, there's still a bit of kind of scare about Russia, you know, communism is now brewing in China, as it's, you know, you're, uh, you're probably, what, pre-Deng at this point, but getting towards that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, just about that era. And the, the issue here is that Francis, I don't know, has possibly not read Anthony C. Sutton. And when you read Anthony C. Sutton, I find it very difficult to suggest anything other than the fact that America is entirely responsible for the creation of communism as an international phenomenon. And when you grasp that, you then understand why these conservatives at the time would take things like socialism and communism at their face value, because they've been brought up in a culture, in a political environment, and they had to engage in a political environment where, for one reason or another, you were you either did or you were told to take communists at their face value because if you were to suggest that there was something else going on, people might dig a bit too much and realise where the money really comes from communist movements. Yeah, the absolute gaslight of the McCarthy era and then the Vietnam era mm. is uh, is something that people don't quite grasp fully. But do, do go on, do continue. <clears throat> The formal critique of egalitarianism by the right has thus been a rewarding one, touching on, an, uh, touching on and illuminating political theory, philosophy, history and science. But I have to say, and indeed I will say, perhaps more than anyone wa- more than anyone wants to hear, that I think much of the old right formal critique of egalitarianism has been somewhat misdirected. In a sense, I believe that it has been beating a dead horse, or more strictly, a dead unicorn, a beast that only exists in legend. The flaw I believe in the conservative formal critique of egalitarianism is that the formal doctrine of equality is in itself non-existent, or at least unimportant. The doctrine of equality is unimportant because no one, save perhaps Paul Pot and Ben Wattenberg, really believes in it, 
and no one, least of all those who profess it most loudly, is seriously motivated by it. This is a truth expressed by the Italian social theorist Wilfredo Pareto in his Treatise of General Sociology. The sentiment that is very inappropriately named equality is fresh, strong, alert, precisely because it is not in fact a sentiment of equality and is not related to any abstraction as a few naive intellectuals still believe, but because it is related to the direct interest of individuals who are bent on escaping certain inequalities not in their favour and setting up new inequalities that will be in their favour, this latter being their chief concern. I mean, I think that's that's not news to possibly people in these sort of circles who have followed along with a lot so of So good. You know, I know it's, it's amazing. I, the, his invocation of Pol Pot as the only true uh, practicer of equality is incredible. <laughs> because he's right. Well, no, that's, I mean, you know, you read Marx and Engels and they discuss the fact that, you know, we are not, we are not utopians. They, they understand that they cannot apply egalitarianism perfectly because they even suggest that some people must be removed from society so that the you know the communist utopia can't just transform but also so it can continue on in future which essentially means that it leaves them an open door to treat certain people as they feel and you know will do with so long as it's uh, politically advantageous to communism which is i think of the whole thing of uh, oh their their whole thing of trying to dispute discursive logic and all sorts of nonsense but <laughs> Well, it's 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 an it's an open ended invitation to have an enemy class. Yes. Um, and a, an open and scapegoat of why you know communism isn't working. It's it's a great parallel between the logic of like democracy and the the whole point of real democracy has never been tried. Um, <laughs> we're just we're just one reform away. We're just one new group of enfranchised people away from paradise, guys. Just stick with it. Don't give up on the system. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it, you're right. That whole that whole section is blistering because it it really does cut to the heart of the the idea that the conservatives going uh, well, you guys aren't living by your own morals, and you go, oh, you guys just don't understand what you're saying. It's like, well, no, they understand completely what well, they're no, saying. How, how many how many times have you seen? I mean, it's not it's not very. It's a bit of a faux pas to do it nowadays because people are probably aware. But say like. 2015, 2016 era of critiquing the left. I mean, how many times did you hear that's not the dream that MLK had? You know, that's that, it is that sort of very ultimately ignorantly dro- driven sort of critique of leftism because they don't understand it's, it's that... It's very the Democrats, the real racists, yes. Yes. Although I did see an article that basically said that on uh, the Tide Pod the other day, but... Uh... We'll move on from that. <laughs> anyway, maybe they need to read I'm, some of I'm this. Already... <laughs> Sorry. Maybe they need to read some of this. I'll, I'll go and I'll go and message Tide Pod Eaters and ask if they want to do some San Francis. <laughs> I don't. I don't think you'll get a response, unfortunately. Um, the real meaning of the doctrine of equality, in other words, can it be grasped? And its real power as a social and ideological force can it be countered merely by a purely formal critique, such as the traditional mounted by the old right? The real meaning of the doctrine of equality is that it serves as a political weapon to be unsheathed whenever it is useful for cutting down barriers, human or institutional, to the power of those groups that wear it on their belts. But because equality, if nothing else, is a two-edged weapon, it is a sword to be kept well away from the hands of those who merely want to fondle it. (laughs) I mean, it's, it's amazing that he is, in those two paragraphs, he is neatly summed up whether meaningfully or not, aspects of, you know, p- you know, Pareto talking about, it's sort of essentially it's myths like equality and and how they work essentially as a political formula, and then he's going into describing them almost through the sort of juvenilian model, <laughs> where you know the, this this ever new form of universalism that you can offer the people against whatever you want to attack will always work if you can make it powerful enough. I know that, that again, I think, I think there's just a great confluence of people reading the writings at the right time, but it's, it's great seeing Sam Francis, um, invoke Prato and mind and society here. Cause <laughs> I didn't realize that reference was in this until I, I bought it and read it, but 
Um, it, it's something that, you know, we stumbled on, not stumbled on, really, but decided to read at basically the same time as this. And the interlinking of it is extremely powerful. I think there's a great pantheon of work from a much older sources being built up here. Mm. And it's great seeing Francis be so uncompromising in a modern critique of this. There is there's very, like I said, there's very little um, that is used in this way that is like post-1945. We're, we're almost getting into uh, liberty or equality level stuff here. Yes, um, it, sort of the kind of theory that you only nowadays see in sort of or not nowadays, but you only really saw, funnily enough, at the same time in Ted Kaczynski, where the the basis point for where you start your assumptions, or for where, for where you start writing, is is based on assumptions of human behaviour that entirely destroy all socialist, communist, and sort of liberal narratives and sort of historical processes and theories. You know, not just in a sort of material sense, uh, argument-wise, also through their own types and sort of almost at the level of metaphysics in a certain kind of way. <laughs> um, I'll continue here because I'd like to read most of this essay, actually. <clears throat> okay, um, well. Or I think we should. It was precisely this understanding of equality as a political weapon that is enshrined in George Orwell's famous but belated insight in Animal Farm, that all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Yet the irony of the slogan is perhaps too rich to be realistic. Um... All, um, always poor sign for totalitarians eventually possessed enough intellectual integrity to at least try to reconcile two contradictory claims and to juxtapose them in a, in a public display. In the real world of egalitarian tyranny, as opposed to that of Orwell's fictional satire, even the degree of intellectual honesty is absent. So even that degree. Um, even the communists, despite their own egalitarian dogmas, soon recovered the elementary facts of human inequality and the elementary principle of the division of labor and social function, which necessarily involves economic and social hierarchy. But it is doubtful that any communist, however skilled and dialect, uh, however skilled a dialectarian, would ever acknowledge the existence of a um, nomenclature or, um, or entrenched elite in the uh, Soviet Union. I'm oh, sorry, a nomen... I can't read that word. Nomenclature or something like that. Nomenclature, yeah. Or entrenched, yeah, I think... It was related to that word in the Soviet Union in any way um, needed to be reconciled with Marxist egalitarian utopianism. It's it's he, what he's basically saying is the left won't justify themselves because fuck you they're in power. Uh, yeah, in a certain <laughs> sense, really. You know, they know that the average person is so stupid that they won't actually grasp what equality means. I mean, it's it's a notion you see. I think it's there's more than once in Burnham some someone is quoted essentially saying something along the lines of, you know, the masses cannot actually hold in them some form of agreeable idea. It's just not possible. There, there was too many people, you know, on that <laughs> to, to, to deal with the understanding of something in a uniform way, which is the irony of the thing in a really deep sense because that's ultimately what these ideas speak to. And when you take them at value for that it's i don't know you you're sort of assuming that these people have the ability to actually break the laws of nature when you suggest that they are literally egalitarians um you can read the next bit because it's full of very difficult words and i'm a bit dyslexic <clears throat> yeah well no <laughs> Yet the use of equality as a political weapon was known long before Orwell or the Communists or the Radical Enlightenment discovered it. At least three authors of classical antiquity recount a story illustrative of the nature of the weapon of its value uh, <clears throat> and of its valuable applications. Periander, the tyrant of Cor Corinth, learned that there were certain nobles in his city who were conspiring against him, but he was unable to discover exactly who they were. So he sent an envoy to his fellow tyrant Thar Tharisibulus or whatever Tharisibulus. I think that's maybe it, of Miletus to ask his advice, as the Greek historian Herodotus described it. Therisiblius. <laughs> this is why I made you read it. <laughs> and I knew this was coming. Invited the man to walk with him from the city to a field where the corn was grown. As he passed through this cornfield, continually asking questions about why the messenger had come to him from Corinth, he kept cutting off all the tallest ears of wheat which he could see, and throwing them away until the finest and best grown part of the crop was ruined. In this way he went right through the field and then sent the messenger away without a word. On his return to Corinth, Periander was eager to hear what advice Therisablius, or whatever, 
had given and the man replied that he had not given any at all, adding that he was surprised at being sent to visit such a person who was evidently mad and a wanton destroyer of his own property, and then described what he had seen to th- seen Thera- Th- Thrasabilius or whatever. God, I, c- you. <laughs> I can't do it anymore. Periander sees the point at once. It was perfectly plain to him that that name recommended the murder of all people in the city who were outstanding and influence or ability. Moreover, he took the advice and from the t- from that time forward, there was no crime against the Corinthians that he did not commit. He did. He did a Paul Potter. was like, he's got glasses. Get him. Yeah, basically. Uh huh. Uh, he can read. He can read. Get him. No one would argue that tyrants such as Thrasybulus and Periander were egalitarian, or that they really believed in or were motivated by any doctrine of equality founded in natural rights or other. Um, other pseudosciences. Sorry, other pseudoscience. There's a footnote there. Um, yet their nature of, yet their use of equality as a weapon to commit a crime, of which uh, Stephen Possumi and Nathaniel Wheel have called <laughs> aristocracide, <laughs> the mass murder of the best elements in society, and to cut down the social constraints and potential threats to their power is not significantly different from the use made of it by modern tyrants whether they are self-proclaimed totalitarians or global democratists. <laughs> He's kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudging at Woodrow Wilson there. That's, a, we'll... that's a great phrase, though, global democratist. That's almost like, that's the kind of thing you think Alex Jones would come out with. I, global I'm, democratists. I was, I've always wondered if Alex Jones ever met San Francisco. He must, they must have been in a similar circle. Oh, the, yeah, no, they've definitely met at, like some weird like conservative magazine yearly meet or something like that. <laughs> I just we need we need like the the from we need like Disney needs to bring back San Francisco as a hologram. Um, <laughs> we need we need him to have an interview with uh, <laughs> uh, with the man himself. No, we and, should take, and discuss the intel war. We should take all the super chat money from all distant right YouTube channels and like bung them into a Chinese project to clone San Francisco. Oh, we've 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 been trying to. Uh, uh, Goose has been talking. He said, said about Dank. Uh, we've been trying to like we've been trying to red pill Dank. Dank's been recommended basically all these books. We finally got him to read uh, Democracy of the God That Failed, and he seems to have absorbed this message. So, mm, so yeah, I, I think I said before I was going to get him on to Schmidt. <laughs> it's oh no, <laughs> oh dear. No, oh think... no, you. Oh no, you guys are Nazis for real. <laughs> uh, the the example they're talking about here though where this these sort of different Greek leaders are essentially using the, the claim of sort of equality as a political weapon. I think there is also a similar example of that in Nemesis, as they're not really discusses some of the early I don't know how you would describe it, shall we say democratic occurrences, quote unquote, in ancient Greece, where you've essentially got to guys run around as sort of I can't remember any of the names I'm afraid I should have taken a better note of it because it's only just come to me now essentially running around Greece centralising as much of it as they can against one another claiming to be the most sort of democratic by trying to go about it in different ways it's... yes yeah he, he basically talks about democracy and antiquity and it's complete the complete farcical nature of it mm. Uh, and how basically they concluded, oh boy, if this was done on, on a much bigger scale, it would be terrible, wink, wink. Mm. Um, it's, <laughs> you can almost, I get it, it's, it's like the Greeks turning <clears throat> the camera. Um, I was going to shall I continue with the rest of this? Because the bottom of this paragraph has probably maybe one of my favourite bits of writing that exists at the moment. Yeah, I'll like, you read it. I'll, I'll, I've put you through the, uh, <laughs> the horrendous Greek names. Uh, so, they, they come up once at least anyway, uh, indeed the use of equality as a weapon by the ancient tyrants like so much else in classical history and literature is paradigmatic and in the modern bureaucratic states and managerial regimes the same application of egalitarianism is made for the same reason though not as always dramatically as in the days of the Greek people <laughs> the irony, not to say the hypocrisy important part there of modern egalitarianism is that it is used not as its proponents claim to restrain or reduce the power of all but to get rid of the power of some 
while at the same time perpetuating or augmenting the power of others. It is my view that once this real as opposed to formal meaning of egalitarianism is grasped, the apparent contradiction between egalitarian preaching and egalitarian practice resolves itself, and the invocation of equality even in sophisticated ideological forms is seen clearly not to be mere hypocrisy or a logical contradiction, but the strategic deployment of a weapon for the seizure of power. Oh. Yeah, it's it's a, a very apparent that for a, a group to gain power in society, another group must lose the power. Mm. Well, this is, is this is a sort of lesson of Pareto, and it was also something that I think Rothbard was slightly tapping into, which is you know public goods are created, and his view by voluntary transactions where you know, more value is imputed into society through a transaction that is the mutual beneficial of wants and whatever else. And in a sense, this creates even more utility than there was before if you could actually measure it. Whereas using non-voluntary measures of social organisation, such as politics, you're only you're only ever able to take away because it's a zero-sum game. You know, you're not you're not adding any utility into society. Um, just to answer a quick question in chat. Democracy of the God that Failed is still in print. It is just increasingly expensive. Yeah, Routledge publishers are big meanies, is essentially the gist of it. Uh, yeah, um, it is a bit behind apparently, but he does. Yeah, this is pure elite theory. It's great. Well, that's this is um, also part of what we're discussing here. I mean, I think one of the one of the things that turns these political elites into the people that they are is that they come to this realization that using political methods as a way to essentially steal things off people in society that you either think are bad or deserve it, or some combination of the two. Like yeah. the South, or whites, or straight people, or so on and so forth. <laughs> well, it's, it's the idea of recognising power. That's mm. it. <laughs> and it's, uh, it, you know, the preaching of egalitarianism in its naive form is, tr you know, it's, it's very, we taught him wrong as a joke. It's stripping people of that ability to do a power analysis, mm. and instead um, imbuing in them this like um, this warm, fuzzy emotional sense that this elite are, are doing good things, guys. We promise. Just hand over more of your lives. Um, in the twentieth century, egalitarianism has been used principally as the political formula or ide ideological rationalization by which one emerging elite has sought to displace from political, economic, and cultural power another elite, and in not only rationalizing, but also disguising the dominance of the new elite. In the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, the development of new physical technologies and a new kind of social organization in the form of bureaucracy served to create, within the bosom of traditional aristocratic and bourgeois elites, a new class of functionaries that gained economic, political, and social rewards from their abilities to operate the new technologies and organizations that's very nearly Ted pilled. Um, <laughs> in, the, in the economy, corpora uh, corporations allowed for the bureaucratization of functions, removing the operation and control of corporate businesses from the hands of stock um, stockholders and um, owner operators, and delivering them increasingly into the control of professional technically trained managers he's he's basically he's channeling a lot of burnham here but he's he's doing some proto leviathan and its enemies well, yeah, if you I enjoy gonna... this this is what leviathan and its enemies is in a very long form yeah as I say, this is this is a very condensed view of the systematical part of that work which is i think the thing that makes it stand out from so much other especially American conservative work where there isn't the framework of an existing history outside of democracy and constitutional democracy you know by looking at the problem systematically and almost kind of in a global scale and applying it universally to what was the phrase here sort of human nature in general yeah. and human organization he he creates this whole structure which then can't be denied as just some part of ideology. You know, it's built like logic. It's it's built like the same way Pareto would look at the political economy. That's a good point brought up by AA there because I was reading this earlier on in the start of uh, Suicide of the West that uh, a lot of Orwell's referencing in uh, 
animal farm is actually to Burnham. Yes. And that Burnham was one of the main, I think, is it is it the managerial revolution that was one of the main inspirations for then that book? And I think it also deeply inspired them in 1984 as well. Yes, a lot of people don't realise that that was the political... It had, it had gained a bit of ground in like the the anti-communist like, uh, uh, zeitgeist of the era, mm. um, but didn't really go much beyond that. Um, but what, we, yeah, what, what we're seeing here really um, is uh, San Francis going... He's, he's essentially going paleocon Ted. It's the other side of the analysis there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because it's, I don't know, I, I, I saw someone, I can't remember where it was, it might have been in the chat of one of our videos, which is basically, um, they were saying that they, they read what you recommended, which was like parts of technological slavery, and parts of um, Leviathan and its enemies, and like now they're gonna, now, now the only thing left for them to do is just like the only conclusion is that they need to buy a rifle if they can. No, the, <laughs> which, I, which the, I thought was really funny. Yeah, the, the combination of the two is is ridiculous i mean i think that's that's definitely something i think we're gonna have to pull up in the post democratization stuff is the the weird nexus of ted kaczynski essentially seeing the same things as a, a worryingly large number of obscure right-wing political theorists who normally in very long-winded ways but appropriately long-winded ways got to it very sort of erudite points and that he just through his system of understanding technology also essentially makes these points is i just find that it's too interesting to ignore well, you you see francis do it he goes you bastards i see what you did there you see sutton do it he goes you bastards i see what you did there you see rothbard do it he just goes you bastards i see what you did you see him places mises do it and they all get to this moment and they go you bastards! I see what you did there with the systemizing of human beings. Um, well, it's it's more the deeper point that especially Francis grasps, which is the the reason why sometimes the ideology comes post hoc is because they're not trying to deal with or appeal to a consistent ideology. They're trying to generate a system of social order that is complex enough and rigid enough in the correct ways to deal with a society that is ultimately growing as a result of the industrial revolution which as a you know as farewell as a, a cause of the repealing of the corn laws i'll continue anyway um an analogous transformation occurred in the state as political institutions began to carry out social and economic functions that involved specialized knowledge and skills that were quite beyond the capabilities of elected or hereditary office holders to perform. In cultural institutions also, educational institutions and uh, later the media uh, of mass communications expanded dramatically in scale and in number and complexity of the functions they performed through their adaptation of new technological processes and their transformation into bureaucratic structures. In all of these social organizations, in the economy, the state, and the culture, there developed at least a latent conflict of interest between, on the one hand, those trained in the technical and managerial functions that in large organizational scale demanded, and on the other, those who were not <clears throat> trained, but who occupied positions of traditional leadership due to their social status, or their own personal talents and qualities of, of leadership. Members of the former group, the emerging elite, increasingly perceive their own interest in lying in the further enlargement and further complexity of organization, while the latter, the old incumbent beliefs, increasingly saw their own power, economic resources, and social status, and social codes as jeopardized by the organizational and managerial revolutions, and the rise of the new class that benefited the most from these revolutions. Um... There's a good bit of a lul in here as well when he talks about, you know, uh, technique and the technical mm. and the idea of just specialized knowledge being a prerequisite for societal power in of itself as a great amount of power. Yes, very much so. I mean, there was also the point I'm trying to remember where I was going to go here, but the, it becomes evident why in the MLK article there was the need to continue because what I say part of the bits we didn't cover in there, but, you know, was the the movement of all sort of universities towards progressive courses, towards progressive studies, towards, you know, specifically technical progressive studies, so that you get a society that has elites that 
generate progressive technical sort of industries or outlets or forms of governance. Um, is there any specific bits you want to pick out of this? Because we are about 45, I know it's a long time, it sounds like a long time, but 45 minutes from 9 o'clock. Mm. Um, and we're not probably going to have time to read this entire essay verbatim. It is a bit longer than that. Uh, we'll uh, carry on for a couple of pages here and then maybe pick out some of the stuff at the end, possibly. Okay. Yeah, the material forces that... Oh, sorry, it's not there that we were. It is... Did you read up to... Yeah, the new class is dependent from these revolutions. Yes. Yet the material forces that drove these revolutions in the forms of new technologies and new kinds of bureaucratic organisation were not sufficient in themselves to carry the emerging elites to social dominance. Their emergence engendered resistance from older elites that retained vested interests in older forms of organisation, and small-scale business firms owned and operated by the same individuals in the forms of family firms and partnerships in parliamentary or congressional institutions and in local and state government that lacked the legal jurisdiction, fiscal resources or physical scope for the for enlargement on the same scale as the centralised ex executive dominated state favoured by the new elite and in compact locally orientated colleges, churches, newspapers and other culture institutions that serve compact, largely homogeneous communities of similar class, ethnic and cultural backgrounds. The persistence of such small, local and personalised institutions served not only to preserve the power of the older elites, but also represented a barrier to the power of the newer elites lodged in large, bureaucratically organised and technologically expansive organisations. I mean, that could be a section right out of Leviathan and its enemies. Just the, the, the density of very specific and technical language in such a big list form. <laughs> he's talking about things like demography. He's talking about things like religion. He's talking about all of these old cultural pillars that have to be ripped down to create this essentially cultural version of a giant strip mall. Mm. This this homogenous, you know, endless, you know, political Walmart <laughs> that takes over America. Mm. And that for the elite class managerialists can only gain power by destroying all these communities and scattering their their functional elements the four winds to, to supplant them with the with themselves well it's, um, he's that was a, is it is also you know the the, the juvenilium model it is the, the 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 thing that wants to become the emergent elite the new top using the bottom of society that being you know the the working class, the poor, the or yeah, the whatever whatever other abstracts they were appealing to at the time, all the disabled orphans or something like that. Oh, we just and, talked about Doctor King, the, mm. the, you know, the plague of the. Oh, well, I'm, I'm I'm thinking more slightly during the managerial revolution era, so you know, early or sort of the progressive era, early twentieth century. That that was still the same process, and they used all these different groups to attack things like churches that stood by their own sort of law in some sort of sense or, you know, the, the, essentially the, the property-owning middle class and... which was something, uh, if I think about it now, is I think Bannon's one of the few people that actually has discussed this book in any length and it's kind of funny that he then mentions similar things of it because I think a latter portion about the Mars stuff discusses that. Yeah. Um, it's also funny that we talked to Phil Bishop about this book and then he went on Bannon. <laughs> yeah, um, that's kind of funny. <laughs> there's, 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 there's like a beautiful San Francis uh, stew going on here. That mm. he's he's essentially getting his vengeance against the neocons in a in a, in a slow roast um, <laughs> from I, beyond the grave. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to stick my stick myself behind that one. <laughs> right, anyway. <laughs> The conflict between these two elites thus tended to assume an ideological and political form as the newer elites sought the direct aid of the state to dislodge their rivals and displace them from power. So, again, there's the, the idea of Juvenel, you know, appealing to the central power, offering it greater centralisation over a wider aspect of society and henceforth destroying things like church and private schools and whatever have you in the process. And the doctrine of egalitarianism was an essential component of their ideological struggle. It's hardly an accident that the progressive movement flourished at the same time that the organisational and managerial revolutions were occurring, for progressivism served as the main ideological vehicle by, 
by which the new elites spawned by these revolutions rode to power and challenged the power of the incumbent elites. It was the inculcation of progressivist premises and doctrines into American culture through the new bureaucracies that emerging elites controlled that remains today, the main ideological support of the new elite's power, and its hegemony cannot be challenged until its ideological base is discredited and broken up. I mean, there's, there is a point in there that he's... You know, you can see what he's talking about in something like a, a series of Rothbard's books, you know, about the, the the myth of the robber barons and stuff like that, where he then, you know, he's essentially talking about how people like the Rockefellers and the Morgans and possibly the Rothschilds to a bit of extent and how those people sort of made their money and that ultimately they get to this era... And then you look in Rothbard's work in the Progressive Era and he's talking about things like the, the Morgan Rockefeller split and the, the Wall Street split from the, the federally involved split of business or I can't remember exactly what he used to describe it, but some of the stuff we talked about in the democratization series before. Yes. You know, he's he's talking about the people who made an absolute fortune out of cashing in on the Industrial Revolution, essentially designing next century and a half's worth of society. <laughs> he makes a point here that I wish we'd included in the Democratization series. Because um, I couldn't really get into like the mass psychology beliefs at the time. It was just too big. Mm. I'd like to do that in retrospect when we get to well, I think uh, that's... basically MKUltra and then talk about Bernays and all these yes. ideas. But he talks about, um, he goes to say that egalitarianism played a central role in the progressivist, and he means it in like... Uh, Woodrow Wilson progressivist, ideological mm. challenge. And the main form it assumed in the early 20th century was that of environmentalism. Not in the contemporary sense of concern for the ecology, but in the sense that human beings are perceived as products of their social and historical environment rather than their own innate mental and physical natures. He's basically talking about the nurture rights, mm. you know, the, the John Moneys of this world, as it were. The people who do not believe that there is any level of biological determinism. Um, that's where all this really came from. You know, egalitarianism was implicit in environmentalist ideology. If the natural or inborn traits of human beings are minimal or non-existent, and if the differentiation among human beings according to class, race, and sexuality, sexuality nationality, etc., is rooted in social environments rather than in nature, then human beings are conceptually reduced uh, to a set of uh, identical reflexes and may be said to be equal. Ah, sorry, I um, <clears throat> had to cough there. Taking uh, Rousseau's famous sentence that the social contract, uh, sentence of the social contract, men are born free but uh, everywhere are in chains, the environmentalist egalitarianism of progressivists identified freedom as uh, the release from chains and a restoration of what they regarded as the natural equality that existed before the chains were collapsed on. Uh, they identify the chains themselves as institutional, intellectual, and the moral fabric of bourgeois society as it was perceived in the late 19th and early 20th century. Basically, it's like an inversion of the the Hoppian idea of like nat natural rights. It's the idea that um, the, the literal idea that all men are created equal. Um, well, the, uh, yeah, which... I mean, it's it is. I mean, the, the sort of I don't know. I, I, Again, it was something we slightly discussed yesterday. I've been reading Filmer's Patriarcha, which is, I don't know, it's given me a, a sort of different perspective on the natural rights case, round about the same time that people were discussing early contract theory like Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. And it's kind of funny to watch Filmer take a sledgehammer to Leviathan, which is normally considered quite a right-wing work, and essentially suggesting that the state of nature is, an, is a myth. It's a complete fallacy. There has never been a free state of nature because we are all sons of Adam <laughs> is the the argument he approaches with it in a sense that all you know the, the sentiment that was ultimately true for the vast majority of people's thinking in the past which is that men are not born free some men are born to rule and some men are born to be ruled and that is that has and always will be the nature of things because you're either ruled by it your fellow man, or you're ruled by God in some sort of way, and that that is, you know, in the, the way that Carlyle would maybe look at it, the sort of the metaphysical form of order that comes from upon high down into the world where we see it propagating yeah. things like monarchy, 
or the ideal man in... as free in the natural world is as mythical as the liberal golden age you know yes. what you can't point to a, uh, a period in time in which democracy was working as intended just like you can't point to a period in time in which natural law was working as intended because because both are are mythical well no you you maybe can but you need to understand natural law as the law of patriarchs not as the law of the free man yes no, I mean, that means in the, the, the invocation of, you know, this egalitarian natural law. Yes. This idea of the of the equal brotherhood of man in nature, uh, as it is as is foisted on people in this weird deterministic way. Yeah, I'll continue on a wee bit here. Surveying what they took as impeding, impending social and economic chaos of the late 19th century, urban poverty, crime, disease, racial conflict, and the dominance and exploitation of industrial wealth through monopoly, Progressivist reformers articulated a social and political theory that centred on environmentalist explanations of, of and so, sorry explanations of and solutions for these problems. An environment that had been made by human beings and could be changed by human beings, wrote Eric Goldman, an account of the ideas of socialist Henry George, who exerted a profound, a profound influence on progressivism in the United States. He determined that all men, institutions and ideas legislating a better environment, particularly a better economic environment, could bring about a better world. Which is essentially just, you know, what more proof do you need that heroes of things like, you know, One Nation Toryism and uh, I think things like, uh, would it be Longism and all these different sort of progressivist conservative ideals of the, the 19 teens and 20s had totally bought into what's referred to as the Marxist meta history. Yeah, they've they've bought into this like Hegelianized Whig view of history, which is the <laughs> March at Robwood, which is what originally I got into like massive bitter arguments with certain people about when I pointed out that they had the exact same formulation of history as as a as a theoretical Marxist does. And that they are thinking in completely deterministic terms that are not compatible with reality and that if they don't stop doing that they're, they're not useful <laughs> it's it's quite incredible when you point out someone's belief in a march ever upwards by ever refining societies that they are essentially brain damaged in their conception of reality because they are <laughs> it, it is one of the is one of the most destructive modes of thinking you can fall into and ripping yourself from that really is one of the first steps to become a useful instrument of change. Hmm. Well, I mean, there's, there's a latter portion here, which I'll read in a sec, but I, when he's talking about environmentalist in this fashion, he is sort of discussing what we see as the sort of officialising of like parliamentary methods. We see that in the same sort of era of time. And... <laughs> It, it it sort of we is the same sort of era we see the discussion of things like the, the science of socialism and there's this notion that po political science science must be po or sort of science must be political but our political forms must be based in some kind of science you know that that idea was very much pushed through this era and still very much holds true and it, that sort of professional clinical science image is something that modern politicians, a la say a Blair at times, or those that you know refer to someone like a Fauci, need to play into, where they they are these supposedly neutral characters acting in a morally neutral way, or possibly even a an inherently beneficial way because they are acting in the good of greater man because science said so. Yeah, they're the they the political empiricoids. Mm. <laughs> they believe that their their power. And their opinion is the neutral position. Well, um, yes, it's it's also the fact that what that allows you to do, though, is engage in tactical plays that are by no means neutral whatsoever. <laughs> Which is part of the thing it goes on to say here. Environment, right, environmentalist ideology was thus especially useful for progressivist reformers and their allies and sponsors in the emerging elites in state and economy. On the one hand, environmentalism challenged the institutions, ideas and values of the old elites, arguing that they were not natural, normative or necessary, just as, you know, these general notions that, you know, oh, these, these were men of the church that created the old sciences, so we must do away with them because they don't reflect our views anymore. But merely adaptations to specific historical circumstances are masked for the continued preeminence of these elites. 
laissez-faire economic theory, constitutionalism, doctrines of the individual responsibility, the bourgeois ethic of work, thrift, providence, and deferral of gratification in the institutions and codes that enshrined these beliefs, especially in the family, local community, and religion of traditional society and the environmentalist critique, were not absolutes, but relative, and could be overcome by those who understood them scientifically and had the administrative and political power to challenge them. Progressivism, through its ideology of environmentalist egalitarianism, rejected, called into question, and in Marxist parlance, demystified and delegitimized not only the excesses of the age, e.g. corruption and exploitation, but also the very foundations of the bourgeois order, its ethics, its religion, its law, and its concept of government, and social political relationships. Oh, again, just a, an astounding combination of concepts to fit all in sort of one large paragraph. It and is a bit it, of a, a mouth and a head full, but yes, it's it's a it's a great. It, you need to be this specific though with the language. Mm, yes, um, it's a great way of saying that really the progressives were able to reconcile the well, at least on the surface, to reconcile in terms of rhetoric. The, the apparent contradictions when it comes to you know the excesses of communism and you know, what is considered un you know un uh, restrained capitalism that they they became what they saw as the the moral guardians of men's environment well, and that they would foster a world in which mankind could be you know good by nature as it were or at least good by nurture <laughs> yeah well they they became the people who were able to be the people that spoke to common sense. You know, there's this sort of idea of demystifying and delegitimizing is, is in the same sense attempting to democratize the very complex and intricate ways in which power works and just explain them to children in civics classes, essentially. Well, I don't know. If, uh, well, he, he, he goes on to describe this in quite a lot of detail. Yes. Um, but we could probably do with moving on to one of the later paragraphs. Uh, yeah, if you want. I mean, there is. It's just the the next part he goes into is starting to discuss how you know this this isn't done sincerely. You know, this the these values are picked and polished for you know this process for for attacking this old order and the values it stands under. Um, yes, again, it, it's all, a lot of it is, is application of theory in De Juvenel, in Prato. Um, there's, again, it's, it's always good if you're ever reading something like this to look at the footnotes and look at the sources of, uh, of who's been talking, you know, who, who inspired, um, San Francis or who inspired some like Hopper, because yeah. there's some good stuff in there from people like Hume, which is quite good to read if you want some slightly less paused, like, history <laughs> of man stuff. Mm, I, might um, con I might continue on from here. Uh, yeah, just for, um, on the on the formal level, the logical hopscotch and forged research of progressivist ideologues like Margaret Mead and Clarence Darrow, who are people mentioned previously, who are like uh, criminal reform people, and this other one, Darrow, uh, I think he he used to essentially run around uh, at jails and courts, essentially appealing that people who were dangerous murderers be set free. So just essentially not the person you want within society at the very least. <laughs> uh, that will turn their environmentalist dogmas into clam chowder, but of course their goal was not to discover truth but to wield power, enveloping the, their pseudoscience and a syrupy utopianism. The progressives appealed to moral sentiments, guilt, hope, fear, envy and resentment and delegitimizing traditional ideas and institutions and those who owned power and status were connected to them and in such episodes as the administrations of Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt <clears throat> they and their heirs managed to get their hands on national political power nor were environmentalist egalitarian ideas confined to criminology anthropo and anthropology they also informed the progressivist views of economics, law in general, education philosophy, sorry, psychology and so, uh, sociology, and thus formed basis of progressivist and liberal social policy for the bulk of the 20th century. It is important to see, wrote sociologist E. Digby Baltzell, that the New Deal's efforts to change the economic and cultural environment largely through legislating greater equality of conditions between classes of men were a reflection of the whole intellectual climate of opinion at the time. 
in almost every area of intellectual endeavour, in theories of crime, in law, in religion and in the arts, there was general agreement as to the sickness of bourgeois society and the need for environmental reform. Um, well, there's a, there's a bit I want to read here before we move on to a bit more of a, an open discussion, mm -hmm. which where he ends up talking about Gramsci, which is brilliant. Uh, yes, we want. Um, it's it's quite a bit further down. It it starts with today in such movements as multiculturalism. Uh, what page is this on? Um, this is two forty seven. Yes, yeah, so, you know. I will just say that that last point though is a very nice sort of succinct wrap up that really explains the whole process where you're you're sort of left there either having to accept the fact that there was an emergent set of elites both politically and intellectually that held within them the very same set of ideas for one reason or another that's all you need to accept you know to, to understand that they may or may not have been working together or it's it's just an accident it's just a complete coincidence that they were all talking about the same stuff and they all had yeah, power it's also completely coincident yeah that they, that they all uh, wielded and gained power um, uh, whilst moving in a similar direction you, you, you have to believe that these people are not only honest actors, but completely neutral to their own self-interests, mm. which, which I think is, is completely absurd. Um, anyway, he goes on later in the piece to say, Today, in such movements as multiculturalism and Afrocentrism, um, in schools and universities, and in reliance on therapy curricula in the form of sensitivity training and human relation courses, we are witnessing what many consider the reducto ad absurdum of progressivist egalitarianism. He's talking about clown world. Uh, <laughs> what he's talking about is also Gottfried's formulation of the managerial therapeutic state, which is a very yes. Kaczynskiist idea, where the system itself develops the methods by which it can de-stress you from its own stressors. <laughs> yes. So, it's a, so that you're ready for more stress. It's a systematic solution to systematic problems. An insert but, image but, of that internet of bodies rand thing with like the depression headset. Oh god, yeah, with the terrible drawings. Um, he's, he's basically saying that Everyone who goes, oh, the left has gone crazy and you know, they're all going to pure spiral into oblivion this time, guys, does not understand reality. Yes. Um, yet it is not really a reduction to absurdity, but merely another twist of the egalitarian dagger. Um, progressives such as Boas and Darrow never heard of the um, the Italian communist um, Antonio Gramsci. Antonio Gramsci. Um, but what they argue about the environment of bourgeois society in the 19th century America is not fundamentally different from Gramsci's argument about cultural hegemony, that elites rule through their dominance of culture more than through their control of the means of production, and that revolutionaries who seek to overthrow an elite must first take a long march to the institutions of culture before trying to wield political or economic power. It is Gramsci's doctrine that is being put into practice today. From the chant Western cultures got to go at Stanford a few years ago, to the tax-funded perversions of Robert Ma Maplethorpe, um, to the claims that Beethoven and Cleopatra were really Africans, the argument is well, <laughs> that Western heterosexual and Caucasian institutions and beliefs are corruptive, repressive, and exploitative incursions into the hegemonic environment that, when scraped away by ill egalitarian social and nice psychic engineering will yield the kind of egalitarian utopia the progressives envision. Only the specific targets have changed, and indeed the targets have always changed throughout the history of the left, as each new utopia turns out to be fake. Um, in the Enlightenment and in much of the classical liberalism, the target was the state, the established churches, aristocracies, guilds, and dynasties of the 19th century. When liberation from these political chains failed to bring about the promised land, and target, the target became the economy, private property, classical economics, and the distribution of, of wealth. And it was merely an economic target that the progressives had in their sights. Um, in the 20th century, the target shifted yet again to social and cultural environment, the family, the school, the religion, the social class, um, and race as a social phenomenon. Eventually, we can predict egalitarians will discover, and indeed now are discovering, that nature itself is the source of inequality, um, at which point they will have come full circle and find themselves in agreement with Dr. <laughs> Fleming and Dr. Goldberg. Um, but it won't make any difference. Whether egalitarians recognize it 
recognizing at last the inequality is ultimately rooted in man's nature, accept the lessons, or whether through genetic engineering and state-funded lobotomies or depression headsets, uh, <laughs> they will depend less on who and how many really believe in the egalitarian lie than who stands to gain from wielding the egalitarian sword. That's uh, it's kind of a bleak ending there, Mr. Francis. But uh, what, what, what he's basically saying is that they will, they are coming round to the point that you know men are not created equal, and and here's here's why that's a bad thing, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah. Here's why you you need to live in the pod and wear your depression headset. Well, no, uh, no, no, because... no. Wait, no. It'll be people. It for for the last two thousand years, it has been people are not equal, and that's bad. And at some point in the near future, it'll be people are not equal, and that's good because it's allowed us to develop the technological solutions to make people equal. Just, just wait for that. Just wait, right. just wait for that when I come across. I will say there is there is one thing in here that the mention of Gramsci, and I, I, he's he's not necessarily tapping quite into it, but the the long march through the institutions as we were discussing before slightly, where you have all these people in the same positions for one reason or another, all hold the same ideas, it doesn't necessarily have to be a deliberate process that's centrally organised. You know, it, it doesn't have to be one cult of people who have taken apart, or taken upon themselves, sorry, to, to en- engage in a progressive agenda. There are people who are part of a cult that probably did those very things. There are probably many cults that did that kind of thing. But ultimately what we are seeing is man dealing with the evolution of the idea of egalitarianism and the and the varying types of social and political settings that we find ourselves tumbling through. Yes, it's, which it's is, also... Which is why this... right-wing Gramsciism doesn't work, because the very no. institutions that you're trying to march through were marched through in their creation by a differing set of approaches to ideas like egalitarianism you you cannot desystematize by approaching a systematized approach however you, there is there you, is no managerial solution to managerialism there is actually there is one <laughs> there is the 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 instant revolution locally of you know power centers across the entire west against globalism and the sort of a uh, I think what was it Charlemagne was calling it guerrilla mode nationalism. Insert images of Mussolini looking like he's may may or may not have Joe Rogan photoshopped in his yeah, place. It's, it's it's a very specific action which is turning some of the cogs in the machine the wrong way around, turning mm. it on and watching it smash itself. But, but we did we had a laugh at that on the TED stream of the fact that you know the, the solution to managerialism is one instantaneous act of one of the most brilliant managerialist applications of human knowledge ever. <laughs> but it's, yeah, you can't you can't do the long march through the institutions as a, as a as a right wing force. It is impossible um, because of the the nature of them. You can't do that slow boil. It mm. doesn't work. There is there is no incrementalist reformist solution because of the nature of what you're trying to do. Um, these systems uh, were developed in a way that they are, you know, self-perpetuating and expanding, and the left were able to hijack that by promising them further expansion and power. Yeah. It, it was a, a confluence between the priorities of a of a class and the emergent priorities of a system, because of how it was set up. Mm-hmm. And we, people need to understand that it is the the confluence of technology system as a systematization and a lot of like post hoc ideology power politics which is basically you going to the ministers of the system and saying i will make you even more powerful <laughs> and well, the right the right can't do that because they're not going to well yeah because i mean hopper has there is a point from hopper that applies that to democracy which is to say that as democracy continues on it will have to make appeal by because it's you know if we are to take it at face value that it must make some appeal to popular sentiment the popular sentiment will be to make the most of either false promises or real promises that you can therefore you must promise people as much as you can and therefore you you begin to develop and strengthen these egalitarian ideas i mean that's how you end up with things like the welfare state and it then becomes 
politically unacceptable to be against a welfare state or it becomes politically unacceptable to be against universal suffrage. Well, it, it also becomes a state in which politicians promise that they can stop your nose from running and the wind from blowing. Um, that they can control viruses and the weather. Mm. Um, that... <laughs> I mean, that's... I'm sorry, the, the person chat. That's not a no to the based social credit score. It's just that, like, I would only ever want that and I would hope only every everyone else would only want that until that essentially we had removed leftists from society and then we can go back to living in a world that's not... I don't know, this. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's ultimately... Uh, it's Marx... It's understanding a, a Marxist revolution. You have the the first instance where you make use of the existing machinery to smash the machinery, and then you end up in a stage where people essentially doubt. They, they all agree to down tools of the state and go back to like a a life that's worth living. But yes, we we are reaching kind of near the end. We are going to be finishing uh, at or before it, uh, nine o'clock mm. because we will be actually handing over to a different stream, won't we? Uh, I don't know if Apostolic Majesty and the rest of the Pasta Posse, as they're affectionately known, will be streaming today. However, they will. I think next Monday. So, but I don't okay. Know. Well, we'll we'll give them a shout out anyway. If they're not streaming, um, go and sub to them. Uh, yes. We'll, we'll, I'll put I'll put if you link me that on Discord, everything I'll put their stuff in the chat. But if you guys want to ask any questions, uh feel free. We are we are gonna take some questions now. Yeah. Uh, can... Feel free to do them in the form of a donation because we're just <laughs> gonna do it to buy more books and become uh, more wink, based. Wink wink nudge nudge. Um I don't know if AA is still watching or not, but I, I will admit that a lot of the well, the majority of the books that are seen in the, the based bookcase are not from uh my collection. And I am merely supplementing with my income the requests, mostly of Evelyn, for enhancing the library. Mm. Um, if I get a British night, you've been a member for eight months. Good lord, have we been monetized that long already? Um, he says Kojima pilled, EMP the country, and returned to a free pretext society. <sighs> yes. Did I, I do like it. I do like it a rot. Ah, <laughs> um, <laughs> <clears throat> uh, Kojima. Uh, you don't understand. I don't know. I, <laughs> bit bit of a Kojima tangent, but there are some amazing like semi memes in things like Death Stranding with just how batshit it is. Um, that man does not know what he's doing, but it is still glorious. Um, but it it is part of that like weird ideological soup out of which uh, things like Metal Gear Solid came from. Of just like, what if we took all this skit stuff and did some Japanese rule of cool with it? We need more fiction like that, because at least it's not, you know, paused. Um, <laughs> he also did have a character that literally breathed through her skin, so, um, <laughs> which is uh, kind of funny. Um, I guess say for for those wanting to read along, I would definitely recommend Beautiful Losers. It is really, I think, an essential work for the hard edged. Uh, like the 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 only really hard edge stuff in the paleocon sphere. There's very little else. Oh like yeah, I, I mean people talk about Burnham and Buckley and the likes, but this I think Francis's work, especially. I mean, I, I mean my opinion is probably different because I know him primarily for Leviathan and his enemies. So that's you know Francis channeling this bizarre eclectic mix of European forgotten elitist thinkers as Francis to me. <laughs> yeah, that is like I said, that's him at his most analytical. It's, it would be like it would be like looking at you know, Friedman compared to like Mises or Rothbard, you know, as a completely different level of thinker who is in touch with the political process and subsequently human nature in a much more ephemeral and useful form than someone who's who's just trying to deal with the empirical science of politics well um i i saw a lot of them on ebay and, and took my opportunity we, we've got a lot of alul to read but i'm fascinated as i read more of him by his kind of he, he is like the underpinning like metaphysics of ted mm -hmm. um being somebody who was very unashamedly of faith um, well, no, he's, he, as supposedly the the cornerstone of any worthwhile Christian anarchism, has been explained to me. So I'm, I'm gonna, I know that I, I was thinking I was gonna do Elul after Falmer because they're both heavily Christian, but uh, Suicide of the West has tempted me. 
So I think I'll get tucked into that and then I'll double bill some Alul because that Alul violence one, again, if AA is still around, I would Break wonder cover. I would wonder if that might answer some of his questions as to how Christians explain the abuse of Christianity for what it was, you know, even from, even during the, the, the 20th century and obviously in the 21st century and all the paused versions of it we have now. Oh, he, Elul also wrote a book, um, quite literally, I think, called uh, The Subversion of Christianity, which I'm very tempted to buy. That's probably worth uh, it. Because <laughs> its cover is like, I, I don't know, it, it its cover is, uh, is it's slightly Stephen King, but it's also like uh, deeply, uh, uh, deeply subversive. Well, I think that um, that violence one is from like the late 70s, early 80s. Yes. I'll put it in the chat, but this... Um, sorry, I'll put it in the Discord chat, sorry. Uh, actually, I'll just DM it to you since it's just you and me. But this is the cover. I don't know, I kind of like the imagery of like the twisted extra upside-down cross on there. It's just, it's very... Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would put that in the stream, but I don't want to fanny about with... Uh, what do you call it? Ye olde OBS at the moment. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just link the, the JPEG for those interested. Um, so it can, yeah. The Subversion of Christianity, though, is not something I have not read, but it's something I'm interested in reading um, because it's I'm I'm very very intrigued by uh, Alul, and uh, I I have read Propaganda. Propaganda is his most famous work, mm. along with the Technological Society, which was written in the fifties, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> This this man was essentially proto Ted Pilled in the fifties, um, as along with being a very interesting, essentially Christian anarchist. Mm. Um, he, he's a very intriguing thinker. I I again not to not not to continually appeal to Daddy AA, but the he did mention on on Gab. Um, I thought, I'm really not a big fan of Gab to be honest, but it does seem to be one of the only one of the few places people can communicate uh, that he saw a communist podcast. A, like essentially reviewing Leviathan and its enemies, and I'd be incredibly yeah. interested. I, th I think I responded that. to his comment or his thing on Gab, but he's probably not seen it because he does not follow I, me. F. I, I <laughs> he, fo he follows me again. <laughs> uh, you are eternally doomed to not be followed. Um, no, I, I. Uh, yeah, I I really uh, I think it would be interested to see what the what the Marxists have to say about that, um, because it really does speak their language, Viathan. Mm. Um, it really does speak in a lot of what is essentially technical Marxist language in many ways. It does it in you know if they understand the theory in a way that would probably abhor them because it's irrefutable, but um, <laughs> it, it it does really use that framework to to frame what has happened as a as a managerial class war. Which is great. It's that, like I said, as I, as I talked about on, on uh, Twitter recently. It's like, like, that, that little missing piece, um, when you when you read things like Ted, mm. it, it, you read Ted and then you read uh, uh, Francis and then goes, oh, by the way, this was done deliberately by a class of elites to enhance their own power. <laughs> in in what is literally a class war against the rest of humanity. Yeah. I mean, can you can you imagine you know like retrospectively the revisionist stuff? You know, if we if we continue to do the post democratization and give ourselves a framework to base off, I mean, we could write revisionist history about like two thousands Bush and neocons from like a juvenilian perspective. <laughs> um, well, stuff like the whole freedom fry stuff is like perfect Maoism. It's <laughs> wonderful. Uh, it is. It's like like the whole freedom fries and the flag waving, and and all of the like the nine eleven men with stars and stripes Maoism. I might it, it, it is. That's that is what happened after nine eleven was stars and stripes Maoism. Like we saw that we saw like a a cultural revolution in America that was then like subsumed by the left, um, and it became this 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 even more like uh, magic soil society. And you get you know the 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 prophet himself or Obama ascending 
um, from from the from the ashes, you know, creating what happens is you end up with the, the freedom fries Maoism, then the freedom fries Maoism flips itself like the Cultural Revolution, and then the flag wavers become the enemy. Mm-hmm. Um, just like what happened in the Cultural Revolution, well, the it's... students, you know, the students are the embodiment of the revolution. No wait, the students are the enemy. No wait, the farmers are the embodiment of the revolution. No wait, the farmers are the enemy. It was it's exact it's exactly that stuff. Well, as I'm saying, but that on the longer scope gets you from the position of law and order being the upholding of you know i don't know in the american sense good christian values that are effective and moral and you know they're enforced and and amongst the proper code of conduct that being the law and then you know as it slowly degenerates through the one of the main aspects being you know foreign policy you know, America assigning itself as the prime aspect of its law and order is to, to to withhold democracy and human rights across the globe. And democracy and human rights now become your sort of zeitgeist for law and order. And that continues on so that things like trans rights and gay rights and making sure that American medical experimenters can inject people in the third world with AIDS and all sorts of experimental viruses. You know, that becomes your law and order. And you being the dummy that sits there going, woo, law and order the whole time, you support that. Even though you're, <laughs> you're for the most part, appealing to these conservative values of law and order. <laughs> yeah, British night in the chat. Imagine telling the, the lib socks that they've been pawns of the elite for the past century and their import, impotent screeching of revolution has been nothing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing is... The, if you could do that on a mass scale, it would actually break them. If you sit these people down and explain to them in very basic terms how they are essentially their own trots, mm. oh, and yeah. that they have been they have been used in a way that has created this prison for them, and they're unhappy because they've got the logical extension of their own professed beliefs. <laughs> I, I like I like that. that's what you said about Gramsci. If you read Gramsci's leftist, you should just go and kill yourself because you are living in your own utopia and you hate it. Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you read and understand Gramsci, you understand that that has already happened, and that these people have taken power and laughed at you, um, because that was really the ultimate goal of leftist rhetoric was for for an elite class to enhance its own power. <laughs> you 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 really like you think the right's black pill. Imagine how the left is ever going to get if like if if they actually start to lose and start to realize what's really been going on. Oh. If they glimpse behind their own curtain, it's going to get very Jonestown. Very Why do quickly. you think they have to make them? so soy and so infantile and just useless because if they did all wake up one day and realise what was actually being done to the, like imagine if they all woke up one day and someone through a sort of hoppy in lens explained them to or explained to them, you know, the, the process of eroding the value of real labour using inflationary state policy and they understood it all like that, it would be fucking chaos but no, they they don't because they're all thick as shit, and they need to be thick as shit. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. There's 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 a fine point that we've talked about. Whereas there's maybe like twenty to thirty percent of the tankies, if you gave them a copy of Leviathan and its enemies, like it might just click. <laughs> <laughs> mm, who knows? <laughs> anyway, shall uh, we? Shall we yes. thank? The quite a large turnout we've actually had to, which is rather nice. I think that's possibly a credit of the uh, handover earlier on. Which, if I know correctly, what's happening for the deep lore next week? I will be doing a Monday stream next week on my birthday of all things, oh. hopefully with an interesting topic that ties in. Uh, for those who would like to have a brief little look beforehand, have a little glance at things to do with rewilding projects and consider who and it, who at the moment is buying up massive amounts of farmland. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yes, that's going to be a great one because it is a great a great worked example of, of the current environmental agenda mm. and how we are living through... I'll, I'll this need to, transfer of power. I'll need to go through a bit more digging, but if it, if it is working the way I think it is, it should all just be there, plainly written, which I presume it to be. Mm. <clears throat> thank, thank you, thank you, Monsanto. Very cool. Mm. Anyway, um, anything, anything you want to say or show before we go? 
Um, not really. We don't have any rights. I know a few of you guys have signed up for the Substack. Mm. Um, you know, I'll probably just actually show that because I I do still have um, some pieces in in the works for the Substack. Uh, but they're like I've got like ten prototypes. Unfortunately, I haven't finished. I've got the 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 perennial writer's problem of like ten unfinished pieces and nothing coming out. But I'm I'm hoping to finish up. Um, with uh, actually, I might use a little bit of beautiful losers. I, my what actually scares the elite article that I've been writing, threatening yeah. to write now for about three months. <laughs> um, but yeah, the the subset does contain a lot of a lot of stuff on that. It kind of outlines our worldview if you want some extended writings. And forms a bit more of a basis if you're not as as up to date with uh, with our ramblings as uh, as other, some other people might be. Mm. Uh, hopefully, it's some entertaining writing for you to yeah. read as well. I think the only other thing might be depending on what's happening next weekend. We might have more to say about the next Nomos event. Uh, yes, I'm just actually waiting for some venues to get back to me. Um, I I contact them. Uh, just after New Year's, but a lot of them, I think, are just recovering from that and having a bit of a break. So I imagine a lot of events organised have been on holiday for the past week because uh, this is their quiet period. Yeah. But I'm hoping to to hear back definitively from uh, a few a few other uh, venues. So fingers crossed, we'll have some actual details to share with you next week, or at least some preliminary details. Mm. But I will say thank you guys for watching, and have a very good evening. Good night.